we've just heard the, the theme song, so... <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, okay, I mean, um, I mean, let's talk about the let's talk about the book. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, I I think I'm supposed to ask you what the inspiration for the book is, but because th there are things in here that like you didn't necessarily like choose, um, maybe you could just talk about your work more generally. Like what what makes you write? Like what inspires you to write? I think that it will be easier to explain if I try to talk about three books I'm working on right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm working on three books in parallel because they require, they, they demand something from different parts of my brain as, as I felt. One is a novel, I'm, which I'm not sure is a novel. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to work on it for many years and I'm in some, well, I'm in the middle. I'm the good middle, towards the end. It's one about Israel living through some kind of catastrophe they call Asson. Asson is catastrophe in Hebrew, just ca general catastrophe. And between other things that happen to catastrophes, you are, they are inside a hum humanitarian catastrophe per se. But one of the things that happens is that animals start to talk. And this is the end of the game because when you are, when the resources are very scarce and you don't have enough to feed people, of course you can ignore cats until the cat comes and says I'm hungry. Mm -hmm. And that changes everything in a way. But the point is that people, of course, basically immediately decide, and I hope that reader decides too, that we need to help them. We never ask whether we need to share resources and give them independence. It just doesn't come in up in people's minds and in my book it doesn't come in people's minds. It, it doesn't happen. So, And that's a big surprise that animals hold for them this time. But this one I'm writing because because in some way it's irrational. It just tortures me. I keep thinking about this world. I just want it to be Usually I write for one reason. I want it to be over. I want to stop thinking about this thing and as before I finish the book it will never, until I finish the book it will never happen. Another one is a non-fiction I'm trying to write. It's called about the USSR. Mm -hmm. It's a non-fiction for children, uh, ages say 10 to 12. That tells what the fuck was that, how, how we lived there, how their parents and grandparents lived there. So that one I'm writing because of a burning sensation that my students, the children I work with, I discuss literature with, could use it a lot. Mm -hmm. And we as grown-ups could really use a generation that at least knows, not probably not understand, but at least knows where we came from. And the third one is the fiction again, and it's called uh, well, it's it, let's call it the paper charge, the paper charge. It's about imaginary city. It looks like nonfiction, but it's fiction. It's about an imaginary charge in an imaginary Soviet city in the 80s, the underground Christians, and how they tried to live with faith. And this one I'm writing again because I want to stop thinking about that world. So. Every, all the different reasons. Sorry, it was a long one, no, but it, it was an important question. Does it work for you? I mean, do you, yes. st so you stop thinking about it for a while or forever? My I mean best example is I, for two years, every night, I, dream, I dreamed of hell. It was very realistic. There are no pitchforks and no <laughs> demons, but it, it's, believe me, it's an unpleasant place. I was there for two years until I read a book that's called Folklore of the, boo, I can't say it in English, of the inhabitants of the zone M1. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a folklore, it's a collection of folklore where there are people, there's folklore, so there must be folklore in hell, so I wrote a collection of folklore mm -hmm. from hell, and I stopped dreaming about it mm -hmm. at all. Thinking, dreaming, feeling anything. I started dreaming about it. Not the shit, but still. But this, not but this that went one. away. Yes, that yeah. one. It works. Nice. Um, so, I mean, 
I guess like some of the material comes to you in dreams in this way, right? Yeah. But um, I, you also presumably like read a bunch. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I try to. What kinds of things, like when you when you're writing, do you read certain things or do you avoid certain things? Like mm -hmm. how does it work for you? Mm -hmm. Well, um, first of all, I read much less than, than, than I'd like to. I read. I I almost never read contemporary prose for no good reason at all. It's a stupid idios idiosyncrasy. It just doesn't work. I, I don't know why. I just can't. Mm -hmm. But I read a lot of prose from the 20th and 19th centuries. And most of my reading is poetry and nonfiction. Uh -huh. And of course, I have to read a lot about fashion theory because I teach and research. So. Um, which is a bursting field and mm -hmm. there is a lot mm -hmm. of literature coming out every month so it's a lot of work. But right now, for example, I read a lot about the Soviet Union, a lot mm -hmm. of fiction, of course. I, I, there is n no chance otherwise that I will uh, work on the Soviet book and I read a lot especially about the Christians in the USSR is this a stories of faith and sadness and betrayal and they are not not one dim dimensional but they're quite exciting mm -hmm. but there is no feeling i know what you're talking about that i should avoid some mm -hmm. no mm -hmm. no do you i mean do you find that it like that it like obviously you're writing a book about the USSR, so you're reading about like that makes sense. But do you find that things like influence you in a certain way? Absolutely. Do you, like emotionally or so, like substantively, like how? Linguistically. Ah. Uh, I mm. know there are few authors whose language, whose manner of speech, I wish their language stuck to me, but whose manner of speech, I guess, sticks to me. And it's very difficult to shake because I don't want <laughs> to shake it. But I understand this is not my language, not my tone of mm -hmm. voice. This is, of course, Tinyanov. Tinyanov is like nobody else. Um, Nabokov. Mm -hmm. Well, these two, these two are sticky guys. Mm -hmm. But, of course, and Mainly, when you read a lot of poetry, you just live inside it. So it's it's not even an influence. It's like it's like the air, as banal as it sounds, the air you breathe. But when you speak about nonfiction, it triggers you all the time. It brings mm. into you into your vision field think you've never thought about. So that works. Do you t so like? Do you, do you find yourself having like um, like an emotional hangover after you fin even if you don't oh think about god, the yes. topic but like does the feeling stay with you oh my god yes I called uh, there is I called postpartum <laughs> mm -hmm. postpartum depression mm -hmm. and uh, the thing is I have an enormous feeling of guilt if I don't work 24 hours a day so the second I finish a book, the next day I feel guilty that I haven't written anything or done anything. Mm -hmm. And at, at, at the same time, yes, I, I finished children's book less than a month ago, and I should be somehow resting, but I'm pushing myself to do other things. I'm not sure it's good. I, I know that these pauses can be very helpful. They recharge you, but I'm not good at that. I mean, it's very, it's very hard to take a break. It's just like, it's just like a fact. Um, do you have a, a feeling of like, um, you know, interacting with things that are mainstream versus alternative? Like, do you make a division for yourself? Like, do you prefer one over the other, either when we're talking about Soviet stuff or now? No, because for example, I love, I love, TV shows. Mm. TV shows sounds in English. It's very gen. Uh, it's very generic. Um, how do you call 
фикшн shows, the shows that are сериалы, не, например, не реалити шоу, а, например, сериалы. I don't know, like I think in English now you would say like like prestige TV because oh the, yeah, like, yeah, lo- no, like, there like is Mad a discourse. Men. Yeah, yes, like this whole discourse mm-hmm. of prestige TV. Mm-hmm. I have never thought about this word, but in a way, it's mainstream. Mm-hmm. I think that Borges or uh, uh-huh. Tudors or something like that is very mainstream, but mm-hmm. still it's amazing. I I love it. And do you binge? I. It's more than that. I I'm beyond binging. I <laughs> use them like people use music. I work with them while they play at work. So I think it's beyond binging. It's I'm just lost cause. So. Are you somebody who has like a thousand tabs open on your Never. browser? I always oh. have one tab open. I have to do lists, watch lists, everything lists a psychiatrist and two therapists. <laughs> 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 I am aware of the problem, but no, one tab open. One tab open. I, that, that's a, that is, you know, it's like a, a shining Olympus in the distance for me, because <laughs> I always have- Try a psychiatrist and two <laughs> therapists. <laughs> Maybe I should just like, outsource no. the thing that makes me open the multiple tabs to someone yeah. else. Yeah. Um, but, okay, so, there's this like sort of like really canonical question which is also relevant because we're inside of a bookstore so like if you had to choose three books to recommend to other people what would they be and why every day it's something else mm-hmm. or maybe because i just read it maybe because it's it's on my mind do we count poetry i think so i think anything does it read russian yeah sure sure why sure not? okay uh I'd say poetry by Grigory Dashevsky, okay. and a part of it is translated to English, so it's fair game. I'd say uh, Tinyanov, anything, probably Pushkin. That would be an interesting choice. I'm I don't remember whether it was translated, but I guess it was. I feel like it was. And uh, if we speak about nonfiction. Hmm. Let me think for a second. Mm. All the things I think of, uh, all the things I think of, are going uh, uh, somewhere in the in the field of fashion theory, of mm. course. Um, I would say what not to read. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Please. Please don't read any books that that teach you how to dress, how to find your style, how to fuck the fuck out of closets or anything like that don't take any advice books because the whole thing about closets and is that what we do every day everyone on his own is unbelievable when we open the closet door we make a choice in seconds or sometimes in hours <laughs> but we make a choice which is er- a ba- which, which balances so many factors, conscious and subconscious. We think back and forth in time. We go through different social situations in our mind. We see ourselves through the eyes of, uh, of the others, but at the same time we try to keep our identity. It's, it's an unbelievable decision that we make at least once a day, maybe a fr- few times a day, without any fucking help. Mm-hmm. So damn the the advice books on fashion read about what clothes mean to people Mm -hmm. that's exciting Mm -hmm. all the rest is just yeah i remember um i remember in this book there's like a thing about um why why women go like this when something is thrown at them yes yes absolutely and so there's this it really it made me think about like the fact that um or like you can it seems like you connect clothing not just with uh, appearance but like the gestures right there's like it's like uh, which is like I, I don't know I guess like culture and fashion intersect in the but it's you know like how how do clothes force us to gesture in certain ways or not gesture in certain ways so you know it's 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 quite exciting because um, this is an understudied field in fashion theory the body language mm. and the mm. body mechanics mm. 
in connection with clothes. And one of the exciting things I tell my first year, my, my first, how do you call the first grade students, the first graders? First, so year, <laughs> first year, first year. First year mm -hmm. students. When they come to the, my introductory course about fashion, uh, fashion theory, uh, I tell them that every era has special gestures and mm. special body practices mm. that are connected to clothes. For example, we have this. Yes. And this is very yes. new. Yes. This is maybe, this is less than a than hundred years old and even less because, because, you, because it must be elastic for, for yes. that gesture. Yep. On the other hand, we forgot how to take off the gloves because our gloves don't fit properly. Mm -hmm. So taking off the glove is a very slow process, finger by finger. And during that time, you have to manage nice conversation, look somebody in the eye and distract them from this gesture and speak to them. Mm -hmm. And it's a whole art. And there are many, many, many things. We don't know even how to hold our skirts mm -hmm. when we go up the stairs That's because right. we don't wear those skirts. That's right. So this is understudy. And if anybody who is listening to this is considering to go into fashion theory field, this is a subject that awaits its discoveries. I mean, I, I don't know. It's, um, it's a really pleasing topic because it it combines a lot of things into one. Like it's a dis it's a distillation of all these yeah. different questions that are important. Yeah. Um, how are we? Good. Are we are we doing good? Okay. Um, yeah. I mean. So May I ask some? you something? Of course, of, of course. course, of course. You're a translator. You translate a lot. You translate from Russian to English. And when we speak about mixing things together, once upon a time, I had an experience of translating my poetry from Russian to Hebrew, mm -hmm. and I physically felt how two different mechanics in my brain, <laughs> one, one was here and one is there, just tried to crack into each other. So how does it work with you, and do you have physical sense of different languages no but I, I I don't know that I have a physical sense but um, I I really understand this feeling of like wanting to get something out but for me it's like when I read something um, uh, I have this very bad habit which is that when I'm reading something that I really really like I, tr I like try to read pieces out loud to other people and it's it, it's actually it turns out that it's incredibly annoying <laughs> to, those other, to those other people um, but you ca I can't do that mostly with the Russian texts I read, and uh, and the only solution to that problem yes. is to translate, and th yes. that's the that's the impetus. And like the f when I feel um, like frustration or whatever, it's because I'm I, I really like I, d I desperately want to transmit the the original in some way. And it what I've like learned over time is that you you can't do that. I used to think like oh you can just translate literally and it's okay, <laughs> but act but it's. But it's it's completely wrong because you don't. It actually uh, like the more literal you are, uh, the more you erase the voice. So um, yes, I can re I can relate to strong feelings, but not necessarily physical ones. I think we talked. I, I uh, at the meeting at Harvard, I talked to Maria. Yes. And suddenly we've discovered that we both have this feeling in our ton tongue. When words don't come out, when you translate something and you feel that you know yes, what it must yes, be, but yes, you can't say, yes, do you have it? Yes, I do. <laughs> and I, I really, you know, um, one of the things that I, that was like most enjoyable about translating your text is that so, like some, you have, a, there's a lot of like onomatopoeia and like, like neologisms and like that, the, the, there's a way in which that's, it's really freeing to translate that Thank stuff you. because you can, you can just go, you can just go with your feeling, right? You can, um, like, and you, and of course, you know, uh, you hope that you're right and that it's like, doesn't distort your meaning, but um, yes, like it just, it, it's, it's because, and you, you get to be kind of, um, I don't know, you get to be like bold and experimental and you're not, you're not conflicting with a, with any yeah, other type of thing because it's all it's already invented. If, it, if that makes sense. Yes, it, it's um, it totally makes sense. But that feeling of like the like you know the word is out there. I mean, I think like the truth is out there. I think the word the the, the right word is there. It just is a question of finding it. Um, so like when people say like you know Pushkin is untranslatable, like uh, maybe, but it's it's very hard. But I mean, I don't I don't believe it's impossible. <laughs> 
I Do you think it's impossible? Who translated Malinke tragedies, little tragedies, to Hebrew? Okay. It took him ten years. Yeah. Well, he hates it. But yes. That's. <laughs> but he did it, and it's, in my opinion, is brilliant. Mm. So, it's translatable. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we should decide that that's the case. <laughs> good. Good ending. Are we good? Yeah, is that good. what you needed? Okay.